Hi, everybody. Welcome to our presentation on uh, creating safe and brave classrooms, defining what that means, and how we specifically can support LGBTQ plus students in our classes. Again, my name is Morgan Allen White, and I'm the development director at OCCJ. And I'm Sarah Jane Del Monte, um, director of engagement here in Oklahoma City. Morgan is my counter, well, she's my colleague in Tulsa. I am the only person here in the Oklahoma City area, but we are a statewide organization. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Yes, and my pronouns are she, her as well. So OCCJ, our mission is to inspire and equip Oklahomans to remove bias, bigotry, and oppression from our state. Um, we envision Oklahoma to be a more uh, just and inclusive state um, that's hospitable for all Oklahomans. And we do that through programs, through advocacy, um, for um, both adults and children. Uh, some of you I connected with at Civics Day, that was through uh, Generation Citizen, and I talked about our Anytown program, which is a week-long overnight summer camp that goes through diversity, equity, inclusion training for students, teaches about bullying, um, refugees, immigration. Um, it all, we also help them create a plan to take that back to um, their communities. Um, and they also get a chance to learn about a different faith every single day, as well as get to learn themselves. They explore their family, their community. Um, and so it's, um, it's, it's a life-changing, it's a life-changing experience for students. Um, and we do, we are, just so you all know, and you can catch us later, um, we are still enrolling for that and there are scholarships available we actually have rural scholarships as well i've talked with some of you about it um generation citizens uh student of the year um, america she um has enrolled and so she'll be attending that so we're really excited a lot of students from booker t um which were involved in generation citizen too <clears throat> so for context we teach um, and support the use of land acknowledgements. Um, and we really do this to raise awareness about indigenous history um, and perspective of experience of, and suppressed, um, the suppressed and forgotten experiences of indigenous folks. So the practice of implementing a land acknowledgement, it really does give an opportunity to celebrate the indigenous uh, community um, and be acknowledged for their presence um, in the state, which we really feel is important um, considering that we are in Oklahoma. Um, when we do land acknowledgements, we, um, in person, um, I like to say IRL, um, we do them specific to the area. So when we deliver one at an in-person event in Tulsa, it's different than when we do it in Oklahoma City. If we do a virtual training, it is a statewide inclusive um, uh, land acknowledgement. So for, for today, formally, we're going to recognize that Norman, Oklahoma was the traditional home of the Caddo Nation and the Wichita and affiliated tribes. Uh, we acknowledge this territory once also served as a hunting ground, trade exchange point, and migration route for the Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, and Osage Nation. They had their ancestral tribal range within, the, within and beyond what we know as Oklahoma. In addition, 32 other tribal nations from across the continent were forced to relocate to this land within the last 250 years. As an organization dedicated to the elimination of bias, bigotry, and oppression in all of its forms, we believe that tribal sovereignty must be recognized in order for true reconciliation to begin. We rejoice with these tribal nations in each step taken towards this goal and are proud to offer educational opportunities that have elevate native voices in and through our programs. OCCJ stands with the first Americans of our state in our collective efforts to encounter, uh, to counter centuries of attempted genocide. And together we strive towards a more just future for all. If you're interested in learning to, how to create a land acknowledgement, you can reach out to us. That is something that we do teach um, in our adult programming. And a really great resource down here is native-land.ca. It's a great resource for you to use in your classrooms have your students put in their address where, the, where their school is located and actually look at um, the indigenous tribes that have lived through uh, lived on these lands um, throughout the centuries. It's a really, really, really cool resource. If you go to the First Americans Museum website, this exact map is on there. This may be mm -hmm. the map that Carrie referenced because mm -hmm. um, I've seen it used multiple places. 
So um, today we have three goals. Uh, we're going to define safe and brave classrooms and what that might mean for you and your, your schools and your teams. We're going to define allyship specifically for LGBTQ plus people and ways to be an ally in the classroom. And we're also going to learn a strategy, a specific strategy to increase, increase um, student engagement in the classroom and safety as well in the classroom. And I think you all will like it as civics minded folks. So why might we be doing this today? Well, June is actually LGBTQ plus Pride Month, and that commemorates the 1969 Stonewall Uprising in New York City um, that happened in June over the course of three nights. Um, celebrated each June, Pride Month recognizes the impact that LG, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer individuals have had on history locally, nationally, and internationally. Pictured here um, are Sylvia Rivera on the left and Marsha P. Johnson on the right, um, two mothers of a movement um, who, uh, whose contributions cannot, cannot be uh, minimized in any way at all. Um, it's just important to, as we as we talk about the importance of history and accurate history telling, um, that we know that LGBTQ plus people have always been here, um, in Oklahoma specifically. Um, we always will be here, um, and um, we contribute a lot to uh, to the culture. And Marsha is rumored his, with by historians that she threw the first brick at Stonewall. It's controversial. Um, it said that she showed up at two o'clock in the morning. I have heard it back and forth. And then Sylvia, she is known, you may have seen it for a very powerful speech um, on a stage where she talked about her experience um, being arrested, um, what happened to her in jail, uh, also um, how she's lost her job, lost her apartment because of her identity um, and how she's there to fight for the community. Yes, and also a really important to note that Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson dedicated their entire lives to um, helping other uh, trans homeless youth in New York City and started a fund for, for those folks. And just again, their, their impact cannot be understated, but also to orient it to this um, specifically, um, thinking about these folks dedicated their entire lives to empowering young people as well. And so may we attempt to have even a smidgen of, of their courage in order to do that. So today for our uh, workshop, we have four basic ground rules, um, and it's keep it real, keep it balanced, keep it curious, and keep it here. We're going to keep it real because sometimes this stuff is difficult to talk about, um, but it's important and essential that we do so openly and honestly with each other. Um, if we're not open and honest, we cannot attempt to be open and honest with our kids. Um, keep it balanced. Our goal is to work together to address um, challenges and opportunities, and so please feel free to speak up and share Keep it curious to send your certainty and be curious about the content that we're going to present today, um, the perspectives of others in the room, um, and, and also think about the perspectives that may not be in this room today. And also keep it here because what is shared here um, needs to stay here, but what we learn here today can most definitely leave here. So I want you to think about your favorite classroom, whether it's real or it's fictional, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you about mine. So you may see me kind of roll my eyes and not in a bad way, like as I reflect, um, like a lot of times that we do. So um, think about also in that classroom, if it's real or even if it's fictional, maybe you saw it on TV, about the favorite class teacher you had. So for me, my favorite teacher was Mrs. Mangus. Um, and she was a teacher I had in high school. She was very much a mentor. Um, her husband was, was my band teacher. Um, she, this was in Miami, Oklahoma. They're actually from Mustang. Um, I was, uh, she was a back then home ec teacher. Now I believe it's human environmental sciences, but she was a home ec teacher. Um, she, uh, was also did FHA future homemakers of America. Now I believe it's FCCLA. Um, so, um, I just kind of got to know her through someone else in band. Um, I remember meeting her in the hall, she was pregnant, and I just, she was very warm and welcoming. Um, and so I got kind of uh, interested in FHA. I'd always had a passion for children. Um, so I, I started to get involved with FHA, then I took her classes, um, and it was just such a warm and welcome environment. And she created a personal relationship with me. She realized that I came from a single parent household, which is very common um, nowadays that um, 
My mother worked nights and she was not very available for me. Um, so as I started to become one of her students, I um, just created this personal relationship with her, not so much her husband, he was a little bit not so personable. Um, and then I began to babysit for her and she got me involved in FHA. Um, I started off just in her classes. I became a secretary and eventually the president and then I was a subdistrict officer. She took me every place. She took me to the subdistrict uh, conference and meetings to Oklahoma City where we um, competed. Um, so it, she was very much a strong presence for me. Um, and her classroom was very large. It was home ec, so it's very common, four rooms. But when I walked into that, that, that little quad, I very much felt like I was in a different place. We had a sewing room, we had a classroom, a kitchen with four little areas, and then a living room. Um, and it was, it was really a community there. Uh, I also became her teacher's aide. Um, and in that classroom, I just felt at home and each room was different. Um, I remember having my friends there with me. My best friend was in, in um, I think it was family living, basic living skills. And we had to have a baby for a week. I don't think we passed that, but we carried her around. It was a cabbage patch doll and a cabbage patch carrier. Um, I don't think we put it in the locker for a day or anything <laughs> like that, but we just didn't do too well. I'm glad it wasn't an egg, uh, an egg um, cause we probably would have broken it. Um, but it was just that, that camaraderie that we had. Um, and I actually, um, I actually ran into Mrs. Mangus about four years ago. Um, she has retired, her and her husband retired. They live in Mustang again. Um, at that time I was working at Microsoft doing community development. I got a chance to spend time with her while her weird husband just played on a computer and didn't even interact with me, um, which is so Mr. Mangus. I called her Mrs. Mangus. I was in my 40s and I still called her Mrs. Mangus. I had so much respect for her. She influenced me so much. I wound up going, getting my master's degree in family and child studies. Um, she just played a huge part in my life. And think about how many students you get to see years down the line, 20 years down the line. Like that, like your, your impact on them in the classroom is huge. Um, so now that you've thought about your favorite classroom, think about how it was set up. How did your students interact when they were in there? or the students that you saw. Um, if you have multiple classrooms, think about those. What was the vibe that you got from the students? Did they feel safe? Did they feel safe communicating with who they are? And was there a air in that room that of safety too? Um, let's speak to this. So that the whole idea of, of picturing your favorite classroom, picturing those, those impactful people in your lives, this, Classrooms, when we think about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, students absolutely have to feel safe before they can learn. That's it. That's it. If they don't feel safe, then sadly, there's not, it doesn't matter how many things you tell them, it's probably not going to stick because they can't focus on anything but the fact that they are not safe. And what does safety look like? Well, a safe classroom prioritizes emotional and physical safety. And students feel welcomed and included in the class culture. They feel like they're part of the plan. They're part of what are we doing here every day and what's the mission, what's the vision of it. And also um, safe classrooms at their heart um, because they are emotionally safe, they are diversity and inclusion focused and also um, they, they strive to be trauma informed. Now I think I might know what you're thinking. What's the first thing you think of perhaps when you hear the words like safe classroom, safe space? Anybody? Yeah. Like sanctuary. Oh, sanctuary. Okay. Nurtured and supported. Absolutely, absolutely. Has anybody heard any like maybe like not so great interpretations of what safe space or yeah, safe place? Out of the classroom, not the classroom, but the school. Sure. So maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe people think they're too they're too sensitive. They're they're not 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 involving the whole community. These types of things, especially after the past, what we've seen ex happening in in Texas and yeah. I mean, the drills and. About, better schools to be locked down better, have more police, have more scanners, all these things make kids feel unsafe. But that's what they want to do. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, but when we think about 
safe classrooms, the idea of, of safe space, safe classrooms has kind of been, as we've kind of talked about in earlier sessions, um, some words, even though they're not bad words, or they don't mean anything inherently bad for our children, um, they are used by other folks in order to create um, bad definitions, I guess, bad faith definitions of, of what safe is. And so um, safe classrooms may have issues with conflict avoidance because um, the idea of conflating safety and comfort and safety and comfort aren't the same thing. Um, so instead, what I'd like to pitch today is that instead of just safe classrooms, we are creating brave classrooms. Now, brave classrooms have all of those things. They're emotionally safe. They are trauma-informed. They are focused on giving students a voice and a choice. But at brave classrooms also understand that there's ambiguity and that the world doesn't operate in black and white terms. There's a whole spectrum that we have to, that we have to think about in so many ways to be human and show up to class. Brave classrooms embrace challenge by choice, which means that we do know that sometimes the true learning happens at the end of our comfort zone, right? Or just outside of it, right? However, challenge by choice says, we know we're not gonna go past the challenge zone into an arduous zone where we're no longer safe and we don't feel connected to the people around us. Challenge by choice absolutely takes a teacher who's willing to create an environment where students feel like they can make mistakes, get messy, right? The Miss Frizzle original, right? Um, and students feel like they can step outside their comfort zone, but they know they're gonna be supported when they do that. Brave classrooms understand that intention and impact aren't the same thing. What we intend to say and how it comes across to somebody else because of the fact that we can all be so different and come from such different backgrounds, um, the impact of our words does matter as does the intention, but understanding intention and impact. Also, brave classrooms encourage dialogue and not debate. Because in class, there, there should really not, not be any winners and losers. Um, it is about trying to solve the problem together, trying to address the content together, and understanding that there are lots of different ways, especially when we think about history and geography. Um, just thinking about earlier today in the Greenwood um, lecture, he talked about how people wrote in different newspapers about the same event, right? Honoring that people interpret history differently and understanding that there's not gonna be a right, a right, exactly right interpretation of an event. So it understands dialogue and not debate. So why brave spaces? Children come from all different backgrounds, socioeconomical backgrounds, family structure, um, they, um, cultural backgrounds, the environment as well. Um, young adulthood is really a critical state of development. Um, and um, it's, that's why it's so important to see someone, to celebrate them and to create brave spaces. Um, especially uh, for young folks, um, so respecting a youth identity in all forms is very important, including gender expression and gender identity. Um, it's crucial in preventing suicide. Um, youth suicide rates dramatically increased during COVID. Did you say about seven times? I think so. Yeah, it was about seven times. So just imagine you're from a rural community um, and that your community has little to no uh, queer support system. Um, you may not be out. Um, so, and these are examples I've heard, and you may have some feel for your time in. You have to hide your binders in a Doritos bag in your bedroom. You fear that your parent is going to look in your phone and see that you have a boyfriend and you've been communicating with them and because they pay the cell phone bill. Um, I've heard of a parent who saw a, a young lady sneaking into her son's bedroom only to find out her son was a trans woman. And she was sneaking back home so she could take <laughs> her clothes off and come and be her biological self at home. I don't know if you have any examples to add to that that you've encountered working with youth. Yeah, just so many. Um, as When I was a teacher in an elementary school, so just to, just to kind of take it back a little bit, I was the only out teacher. And I had a student who was in fifth grade who came to me and came out. and. Um, it was a big moment for her. She had never met another gay person um, who was an adult, you know, who like was living a life that wasn't like Ellen 
So, so, <laughs> Ellie, yeah, Ellie, sure. <laughs> so, so, you know, just thinking about being what I, what I, what I need to say is brave spaces need to exist because I was the only teacher in the whole building that she felt confident saying that about herself too. And she made me promise pinky swear. I wouldn't tell any other teacher in the building, which of course I don't cause that's against FERPA just so you know. Um, but just thinking about, it takes one affirming adult, one affirming adult in a LGBTQ plus young person's life and the suicide risk is decreased by 75%. And when one in three transgender youth um, attempt or think about suicide, it's absolutely critical. And you can't know, you can't know what a student's home life is all the way, I, I get that, but, but just being a person that they feel comfortable talking to and comfortable sharing with, um, you will never know until maybe 20 years later when they come to your house for coffee that you saved their life. Um, but these situations are just are realities, folks. I mean, this is things that people deal with um, every day, 24 seven. And these are negative norms that have been created by society. Um, so we all know the golden rule. Um, oh, oh, we're gonna do allies. Oh, that's right. okay, okay, okay. The, the, oh, the slides you know, changed. Everybody remember the golden rule. You yes, know. okay. Yeah. So in order to create brave spaces, we need to think about being an ally. And specifically today, we're gonna to talk about being an ally to LGBTQ plus youth. So what's the definition of ally? Well, an ally is someone who is actively supportive of LGBTQ plus people. It encompasses straight and cisgender allies, um, as well as those within the LGBTQ plus community who support each other. Again, realizing that just because we may be a marginalized identity, we don't automatically become an ally to other marginalized identities. Um, and also, um, just when I say cisgender, cisgender means that the, the um, what's on your birth certificate that the doctor said was your your uh, sex identity, you also feel like that is your gender identity. So and, and a, a lot of people do think that if you're uh, cisgendered, you're straight, and you can be queer and be cisgendered. Yes, yes. Cisgender only has to do with the way that we we think about our ourselves as either male, female, other um, non binary, any of those categories. Um, so ways to be an ally. Well, practice respect by using people's correct names and pronouns, especially when they're not around. Um, uh, you know, you may hear somebody who has they them pronouns, um, but if you misgender them when they're not around, it's 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 hurtful, it's painful. So um, stay informed on LGBTQ plus issues. Great news, you're kind of working on this right now. Um, speak up for the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals. Also thinking about the fact that our kids that we serve, they can't vote yet. Um, so who is who is speaking up and advocating for them when they can't? And also be open to change. Again, we're realizing we got to embrace that ambiguity. We have to we have to um, challenge our own assumptions. And then always to remember that being an ally is an action. It's not a, a title or like a special like cookie deserving kind of thing. Being an ally is an action, um, it's a verb. So therefore being passive, being a passive ally is not an option. Golden rule <laughs> now. <laughs> so the golden rule that we're all taught as kids, treat others how you wanna be treated. It, this is, a rule that's wrapped into every religion. Um, but let's look at others from treating them from a different perspective. So we wanna treat others how they want to be treated, not how we want to be treated. And so think about this around allyship. Um, share your identity with your students. Display pride and safe space symbols in your classroom. Use the pronouns that Morgan mentioned. Um, and also, it, Ask the if if ask the um, parent or the children if their parents know what pronouns they're using because if they aren't uh, using the pronouns that are were biologically assigned to them, their parents they may, they may not be out to their parents. So they may be using she they in the classroom, but she it's she her at home. Mm -hmm. So pronouns. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So speaking of pronouns, okay. go take it away. So. Pronouns are words used to replace and refer to proper nouns in conversation. Referring to people by the correct pronouns is a sign of respect. It's hard for us to do this. We mess up all the time, like using them. So, and I, I did it today. So um, Mr. Moreno is doing his presentation on Greenwood, mentioned Dr. Wendy Wil Wilkerson. I went to college with Dr. Wilkerson. I didn't know she was in, in doing social justice work. I hadn't seen her in years. Um, but I was like, Morgan, I know her. And then I realized she uses they now. 
So they use um, they. Yeah, they use they now. But um, And then yesterday, oh my gosh, I was at Brahms. I was like, I'm going to get a milkshake. So I pull, pull up, order my milkshake, and I say, yes, ma'am. And I pulled the window, and it was a young man. Mm-hmm. And I felt so embarrassed, and I didn't know what to say. Mm-hmm. And then I pulled the next window to get my shake, put my straw in, chocolate shake all over my lap, my shirt, my steering wheel, my dashboard, my door. And I was like, that is Buddha handing me my karma for not practicing what I preach. (laughs) Um, So, you know, just look at treating others. Um, I think that's, it's just really using someone's pronoun as a sign of respect. And if you don't know, ask. Um, And I've seen, I think, Mr. Breaker, at Civics Day, you had stickers. And you had, uh, I noticed that, actually, I don't know if everyone had access to the stickers, but there were stickers available for folks to use. Um, so maybe on the first day of class, provide stickers. You can get them on Amazon, pretty cheap. Um, so you know from day one who those students are. Morgan actually um, use, uh, makes buttons. Yeah, yeah. So Pronoun buttons, mm-hmm. um, you can get them from, from well, I, I the local LGBT center in Tulsa um, gives away free pronoun buttons. Um, so if you need some for your classrooms, please feel free to reach out to them for that. Um, but also thinking about a classroom survey, um, I gave with the with the CivicsCon uh, digital guide, there are some resources attached to this presentation. Um, but one of the best ones that I can recommend for y'all as far as pronouns are concerned is doing a simple classroom survey at the beginning of every year where you simply ask as a long time alongside all of your other um, questions, your get to know you questions that you might do, like, did you do you play any sports or um, what are your after school activities? Um, which is also asking, what name do you go by? What pronouns do you use? And um, can I use these pronouns in front of your family? It's just a really couple of quick questions to add to your normal get to know you routine um, that can really help. And one thing that's really what I like about the uh, buttons, Morgan, is that. So the stickers, they use in first day of class. Let's say you use in first day of class. Four months later, they may decide that their pronouns are different. Um, you have the button, like the sticker doesn't go away. They can put it on their backpack. I think one of your students had two stickers on that day. Um, and so that way having that b- button is nice that way they can use it. Um, and one right way that I started using they um, was with my dogs, my plants, and my computer. And I just, instead of saying, oh, she's broken again, uh, it's time to let her out, I just started saying they, and it became very, uh, very easier. Um, and if I don't know someone or I'm just getting to meet them or I'm just meeting them, I'll use the they. Um, so especially if you've got students in your class that are Chris, Kelly, DJ, um, I'm trying to think who else, Dakota, those can be, you know, male or female yeah. or non-binary. Yeah. Um, so, um, just, you know, thinking about that uh, for us, we have pronouns on our name tags. We have them on our business cards, our signature, our signature have a link that says why pronouns. Um, so people can, and I've had people ask me about, you know, and they were like, why do you have this in there? Tell me more about this. Mm-hmm. Um, zoom has a setting where you can go into zoom and you could put your pronouns on there permanently. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can incorporate and be role models too um, around using pronouns as well. <clears throat> um, here are just some um, other sample LGBTQ plus inclusive terms to normalize. This is taken from Advocates for Youth. They're, they're a great organization. They create great guides. Um, but these are just some, some, some basic switching out your um, gender terms to gender neutral terms. And, and okay. oh, yeah. let's go. Um, let me go back to this slide. Yeah. This very last one, or second to last one, paternity and maternity. Um, I don't know if you all have seen recently, Calvin Klein has an ad with a trans man that's pregnant. Um, so that's kind of an example there. Um, because if you say maternity or paternity, that's, there's, our world's changing. I mean, honestly, when it comes down to it, that, that was a very controversial article. Um, or uh, uh, ad, um, but you know, congressman, uh, really for you all, a strong one would uh, have to do with parents, um, because so many children live with other family members. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be one that 
really to think about. And then Morgan, like you said, on the survey, um, asking what their real name is because folks may not go by their their name that's on their the name that they go by. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be, that's on their like school roster, which is also an opportunity for anybody named like Daniel John to say, "Oh, I go by DJ." Right. So it's not just for it's not just for LGBTQ plus students. It's, it's for everybody. Um, so here's some questions to ask: What pronouns do you use? Um, how do you want your parents to know know your pronouns? Do you need help? Let me tell you about this community resource. And that's why we're here. We, we, this is not a curriculum. We are here to resource you so you can resource your students. We want to make that clear um, because like we were talking about earlier, it's a really, very delicate time for teachers. Um, how do you identify? What does your identity mean to you? Um, so many people are afraid to ask these questions. And that's what it comes down to. By asking, your, your, you're recognizing someone. It's a sign of respect. Um, so these are some questions to keep in mind. <clears throat> so let's talk about specifically again, um, ways to support LGBTQ plus youth in your classrooms. Well, one of the first ways to do that is to post affirming signage in your class, in your spaces. What's on the walls? Um, is it inclusive of lots of different perspectives and identities? Um, uh, and I will go into affirming signage more in just a second. Um, diversify your bookshelves and strategies. There are so many ways. Um, to incorporate LGBTQ plus history into um, curriculum, just noting that that some of the people that we do learn about in our textbooks um, are members of the LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, continuing, oh, know those policies and resources for LGBTQ plus youth, like knowing that FERPA does prevent you from outing a student. Okay, um, that's a federal law. And I know that there are some state laws that um, are trying to be a little more divisive for LGBTQ plus youth, but remember those federal policies that keep you protected as well. Um, seek education about LGBTQ plus people and also let youth know that you're a safe person. Just let them know. Um, and remember that a safe person is an active ally and is a respite for, for folks. And also be yourself because students feel safest and most like themselves when you are being yourself. Because fake is is a is a is a mode that teens especially can spot from a mile away. They know when you're not being genuine. They know when you don't really care. They know when um, they know they know what's up. Just trust, 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 and believe. And if you're not being safe, yes, <laughs> and they will pull away from you at that point, yeah. and that's going to affect their performance in the classroom as and well. Attend and attendance as well. I mean, if if you're not a classroom, like just think about classrooms that you classes in college or high school or in elementary school, you didn't want to miss. I never missed music music class. I wanted to be on my best behavior so I could be sure I got to go to music class. You right? wanted Mr. Mangus's class. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here are just some examples of affirming signage. Um, displaying a pride button or a flag, pride button really small on your, on your cork board or outside your window. Um, feature artwork or um, ha as for history folks, or geography folks, feature um, notable LGBTQ plus people as part of your um, notable folks on your walls. Um, have a safe zone or safe space um, sign. And today, all of you are gonna leave with a beautiful sticker that says this is an inclusive classroom that you can put on your windows or on your, your whiteboards, et cetera. And also, um, here are some examples of affirming posters. Uh, Learning for Justice, y'all probably know about Learning for Justice. They're great. They used to be called Teaching Tolerance, if that rings bell with anybody else. But they have free posters you can print off that have quotes from folks like Laverne Cox or Harvey Milk as historical figures, um, and also lots of other. They have they have one with Lizzo. It's it's great, great, awesome, inspiring quotes for young people. And they have curriculum on there as well, I believe. Yes, and and, and lesson plans that also have the standards on them as well. And then think about books for all readers. Um, and remembering, I know that there are, um, I know that there are book laws in Oklahoma. I want to, I want to fully say that I know that. Um, but also recognizing that your local library can be your best, best friend. And almost all of the local libraries in, in Oklahoma have some sort of mobile app that you can download. And you can, you can give that to your students. Tell them to download the app or access the library online, um, and they can get any any of these books on here uh, and, and rent them and keep them, have the audiobook versions of it, all sorts of things, graphic novels, all of that's available from your local library. And guess what? The local library doesn't have to answer to your principal or any angry parents. 
Um, learningforjustice.org, like I said earlier, GLSEN um, is a great resource for curriculum and a book list, welcomingschools.org. Again, book lists, all of this stuff, they have everything ready. All you got to do is go there, print off a recommended book list out and hand it to a kid and, and, and you're done. And re remind, I, remind us what GLSEN stands for. GLSEN, um, it's, well, it's kind of like, um, WW, like Weight Watchers now just goes by WW. Glisten now just goes by Glisten. But it's the Gay and Lesbian Student Education Network. So, um. and also um, the New York City Public Library, I believe it is. Now anyone in the United States can have a free membership mm -hmm. for their, uh, yeah, for their, uh, for, for digital books. Yes. So um, they can go there and access the media um, no matter where they are in the US. So um, speaking of history, this really great one by Gail Pittman is for young readers for like I would say um, fifth grade to ninth grade probably readers. Um, it celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, but it writes it in a it writes about history in a way that kids it's accessible. You know, also there's a great one called the hit the LG, the queer history of the United States for young people as well. There's great 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 books. So. Um, so kind of back to what Morgan was saying, get to know your students, get to know their personalities. Are they nerdy? What type of books do they like to read? Um, do they have hobbies? Are they in band? Do they like their band teacher? Um, so, <laughs> and ask why, ask why that they like these things. Cause it's going to be, you know, if they like music, well, what type of music do you like? Um, and so really, um, Really knowing who they are is going to make a difference. It's going to help them trust you more and feel safe in your classroom. Um, I'll uh, use like I'm just reiterating what Morgan says: culturally relevant examples. Whenever you're teaching, um, we tend to use, um, especially in Oklahoma, white heteronormal Christian um, examples. So think about what you're using, um, whether it's in context of the LGBTQ plus community or just Culture, being culturally relevant. Um, have the students set up their, uh, your space as well. I visited a classroom and talked with a teacher where she set up the space with different uh, sections. And it wasn't like learning stations. She had a beanbag section. She had a bistro table. She had ta desks. She had like four tables put together. And so it was like a kinesthetic learning experience where the students could go wherever they most felt comfortable and do their, their work. Um, also, the use, use of a comment box is really great. Um, you could, I, um, was, I read a story recently about a teacher that started using the comment box. And at first she started just having them put notes in there um, just to kind of get to learn about them and see if they had any needs. Then she realized she wasn't getting a high response. So what she did was have every student at the end of class put a note, a piece of paper in there passed out, everyone's paper looked the same, and they could write down something. If they didn't want to write down something, they didn't have to. But she got to learn maybe who, whose dog died last night, or they haven't eaten for the past two days, or I've been sitting um, by Joe and he bullies me. Um, so it's a way for you to, to get to learn the students as well. Um, and you just tell them just to, you know, nothing today or whatever on there, or you're an awesome teacher um, <laughs> and just have them put it in the box. Um, and some of the other things on here we'll talk about here in a minute. Mm -hmm. So again, just remembering, encouraging that dialogue over debate, consider um, doing a classroom audit for inclusion, asking, uh, asking the students, taking a student survey, what works in here, what might not be working in here. Great way to get them involved in the process of how things, how their futures will work. They've got to be collaboratively learning for the rest of their lives. Look at us here today. Um, so the big thing that I want to um, pitch today as far as creating brave, spa brave, brave spaces for LGBTQ plus youth is thinking about drafting or creating a charter for your classroom or community agreements. And so um, this, is an, this is an activity, a great activity for the first week of school. Um, to ask students when they come in the room, you have pieces of paper or post-its or something on their, on their desk. You ask them, how do you wanna feel when you are in this space? When you are in my classroom, how do you wanna feel? Um, and very, very often folks will say, kids will say things like, I wanna feel safe. I wanna feel supported. I wanna feel respected. Um, I wanna feel excited. I wanna feel not bored, right? These are some other things that they'll write, right? So then you can turn these feelings, ask them, 
Well, how do, how do we ensure that you feel excited in this classroom? Turn it into agreements. Um, how do you feel heard? Well, we need to voice our opinions and ideas. Well, sounds easy enough, right? But what does that really mean? Have them define everything. It means that we need to think before we speak. It means that we need to use a respectful tone with each other. Um, when we speak, it should contribute to learning. Everyone should be given the chance to voice their opinions and ideas. That means we have to listen to each other. That means we care about each other so that we want to listen to each other. So then, remembering it's the student voice, this is a student-driven activity. A great thing to remember um, is also like thinking about how this is a mutually beneficial document, right? So the things that we're gonna put in this charter, I'm gonna, as the teacher, I will adhere to this too. I will make sure I respect every single one of you. I will show you that you're safe and supported. But in turn, that also means as students that I expect you to show me respect. And I expect you to care about me as well because I'm gonna pour into you and I would like to have something given back, right? So then this you turn back to like the state standards. Like we mm -hmm. created this charter in the classroom and we're gonna treat each other with respect. And this is like, this is, this is our constitution. This is, my, and when I was a teacher, we loved to call it our student bill of rights. It's your, it's your rights. And it, this is what you deserve when you come in here. And so we're gonna hold ourselves to this. So these agreements become a charter. So perhaps if you're in a younger classroom, you can write it all out, have it on the board at all times. Um, we want to feel respected, excited, smart, happy, included, unique, so we will treat each other the way we want to be treated. We will show enthusiasm with a positive attitude, all of these types of things. Or maybe if you are um, in a middle school classroom, this might be what you have. We seek to understand differing perspectives at time agreeing to disagree. We will be respectful. We lurk collaboratively. We maintain good vibes. That might be a really good one that comes on one of those notes, right? In our classroom by checking in with one another and supporting each other. And we'll be kind every day. So just some general tips when doing this activity. Just know it's going to take about one class period. If you have um, multiple classes, you can get them all involved and create one one big charter in the end of the week that has all the classes. This is what we agree to. Um, but remember, the shared definitions are essential. That way, when somebody when somebody breaks the charter and we have to address it, we all know exactly what we mean when we said respect. We all know exactly what we mean when we said inclusive classroom. Every voice needs to be heard, every student, because everybody has to agree to the charter. And a great thing that a lot of folks do at the end is have a student sign the charter. This is especially great for um, younger classrooms too, because then the whole class can sign it and be at the end. And then again, when, uh, when, uh, when part of the contract is broken, you could say, well, Samantha, you signed this here. And that, that meant you were gonna agree to our class charter. So it's a great way to, to keep everybody involved. Um, discuss, I, get, I already mentioned this, but discuss the teacher-student dynamic and understand that I, you deserve respect. You deserve respect as a student. And maybe that's the first time they've ever been able to hear that. So, um, and also remember the charter, charter is a living document which means that if something stops working, we maybe need to write an amendment, right? We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to bring it up. If, if we're noticing constant troubles in the classroom with a particular rule, then we need to discuss it as a class, go into special session, right? So here's a great rough draft of community agreements by an English teacher um, named Leah Colote. And this was her um, in, in agreements specifically while do, still doing um, online learning, which, who knows if that's, who, who knows what, what it all holds, what our future classrooms look like. But again, this is a really great one. Um, if you wanna see the full resource, you can scan this QR code. Um, I really love this one. So in our English class, we want a positive, supportive, respectful environment. Where we can participate in a mode that is relaxed and appealing for each of us. We wanna be empathetic, patient, and understanding of others because life is hard right now, especially. We will create a relaxed, easygoing, productive class by shouting out each other's strengths and being mindful of how we participate and how much we're talking versus listening to others and committing to being engaged and present while we have this time together to ensure that everyone feels welcome and that they're able to be successful. We will hold each other accountable by calling out behaviors that are toxic, disrespectful, or uncomfortable in a compassionate way. So that's just what it might look like in the end. But you can still see all those feeling words, all of and and the action items that are within this one community agreement.
And we'll get um, the presentation to the yes. team so that way you can scan that uh, QR code. But like I said, we're here to resource you. Um, and there are a ton of resources throughout the state. Um, Pivot uh, and Youth Services. Um, Pivot, it used to be Youth Services of Oklahoma County. Um, some of the Youth Services uh, uh, organizations have changed their name, uh, but they do with hou housing, shelter, counseling, a um, lot of uh, social services for schools. Um, there is a, um, I know there's a Pivot in Enid. Um, Shree Kelly is the person there. Um, they do great work and they're throughout the state. SISU is a really unique organization. It's here in Oklahoma City and it's a shelter for LGBTQ youth, I believe ages 16, maybe it's 15 to 23. They have a day shelter and a night shelter. And a lot of people, a lot of LGBTQ plus students are homeless, but people don't realize it because when you're that age, it's okay to sleep on your friend's couch. You're not, and that's, couch homeless is, is real. I was couch homeless before I went to school, well, before I went to college. Um, I stayed with a friend for a couple of months, and then I realized by going to school, I would be in a safe place where I had food and housing. Um, and I never thought I would get past my first semester. Oh, by going um, to college. By going to college. Okay. I was able to live in a dorm. Yeah. Um, and then, thank you, Mrs. Mangus, for what you did, because you, you know, helped me be a mentor for other people now. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's us. Um, PFLAG is a statewide organization. Mm -hmm. There's Thrive and also this is Amplify. They are a sexual health collective. They used to be the campaign for teen pregnancy, but now they um, work with uh, all different students, no matter what their gen gender identity is. Um, there is also an organization called Period OKC. Part of their, um, their mission is to remove the stigma around uh, menstruation. Um, they will ship things statewide um, and they have everything from pads to tampons to cups um, and they work with trans students because if you're a trans, um, a trans man, you're gonna still have your period but you may feel uncomfortable going to the bathroom or not have a place to go to the bathroom. So cups can be used all day long. Um, so they do service all, all, the whole community, no matter your, what age. Um, they, you can contact them and they will send you things for your classroom. So if your students need them, mm -hmm. and then you can let your students know that they're there and they're free. Um, and is there an organization like that in Tulsa? Is it just called? Yeah, actually you can, you can get, um, uh, free menstrual products um at the at the equality center in tulsa which is also where you can get those buttons by the way um and will you talk about the nest also yeah so the nest um a, a, a certain concern for lgbtq plus youth is um gendered gendered housing especially when um, we're thinking about inpatient care needing to go um uh, in inpatient and um this is cedar ridge behavioral health it's located in edmond and um they have this nest program for LGBTQ plus young people who need to be inpatient and need to receive intensive counseling services. Um, and there they uh, affirm gender identity of trans um, young people so that they can have, a, they're not, they're, 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 so the current situation is not exacerbated by the fact that they are also being denied their basic um, gender identity, um, having to stay in a male, an all male floor or being called the wrong name, the wrong pronouns the entire time while, while receiving care. But again, these are resources. Yes. These are resources to give your students if they come to you um, so they can take that and empower themselves. Um, so, you know, we just want you to make sure that we want to make sure that you all have these. Um, I want to also give a special shout out. Um, Freedom Oklahoma is located here in the central region of the state and they have um, special like teacher caucuses um, and support groups um, and also student groups. Um, but they, they, they work on LGBTQ plus legislation in the state. So if especially I'm, I'm very sure they would be interested in speaking with your class and in being involved and being a resource to, resource to you um, to get involved with our local legislation. I'm also thinking about online resources because of course we know that sometimes kids can't go out and, and get some of these community resources. So here are four online resources for young people, including um, two um, hotlines that are available 24 seven. Glisten again, this is the Glisten website and Q chat space, which is a, um, which is a safe 
um, chat um, online um, community for LGBTQ plus youth run through the national um, the National Conference for LGBTQ plus centers. Centerlink is what it is called. So our key takeaways are that creating brave classroom spaces, um, it's foundational for student success. And inclusive language, like learning about pronouns, learning about um, gender neutral things, um, it helps ensure that all student perspectives are honored. And also LGBTQ plus youth need desperately adult allies in their schools. And respecting student voice increases engagement in the classroom. Here are our emails. I also have my card here. And then of course, um, your inclusive classroom sticker if you would like it. Um, thank you so much. And this book also, did you oh, mention that it can be accessed online? I didn't mention this. I, I created this guide about a year ago for um, educators in the Tulsa area, but it is very relevant. It goes over federal policies that protect LGBTQ plus youth and notes how to balance those state and federal policies in your schools. Um, it has a whole bunch of different things, including like a pride flag guide, uh, that same thing, this classroom survey. And um, it is available digitally at okeq.org slash youth. Um, and also, if you ever have any questions about anything, um, my card will be up here, and I, I just I I will always be ready to talk about how we can make our schools awesome. Questions? Yeah, it's heavy. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Um, okay, sorry, I'm very new to this. So can you explain what's the difference between using the pronouns he and her or she versus they? Like, what is they? First, before if, if you want to answer, you just did what you're supposed to do as an ally. You ask the question that's hard to ask. So, I don't want to upset and that is the so. purpose of, of being here today is to make sure that doesn't happen. So kudos to you. Um, one of the things that, you know, they is just a singular pronoun. It, it does not have an, a gender inherently attached to they, right? Um, so a lot of non-binary folks will use they. Um, it's a it's a very common uh, pronoun to use. That's not to say all non-binary people use they them pronouns. Some of them we had the other one that has had like z them. That's that's called a neo pronoun. Sorry to go like level two, three, four, five here, but <laughs> but just really, but really what you need to learn know is like he, she, and they are like three major pronouns that we use. Um, and your pronouns really it doesn't have anything to do with necessarily how you identify it, but it but it can. Um, so I use she, her pronouns. Um, so when, oh, I was, I was talking about this yesterday with my wife, cause I was trying to figure out how I was going to explain this. So Jim needs to go to the store. He needs to get eggs versus Morgan needs to go to the store. She needs to get eggs versus my non-binary friend, Anna needs to go to the store. They need to get eggs. And that's that's as, that's really as simple as it is. It's it's like it's an English lesson, right? And with they, sometimes there's sometimes when they identify as a female in certain situations and sometimes as a male. Um, so that can be, you know, kind of like the young lady that was sneaking into the bedroom. Yeah. So, <laughs> of yeah. So, but can you go through go into a little bit more detail of not the of non-binary? Okay, non-binary um, essentially at its root just means neither male nor female um, identifying gender specific. Um, so um, it's not like gender, remember how I talked about that beautiful idea of spectrums, thinking in like the big spectrum, thinking of that big rainbowy kind of chart that we have when we need to pick a color on Microsoft Word, right? So thinking about it like that, um, it's, not, it's not a straight line where like males on one side, females on the other side, and then non-binary is in the middle. It's like it's like a completely different color. Like teal is a completely different color from blue and green. And we wouldn't say it's more blue, more green. It's not more blue or more green. It's teal, right? So it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. No. It's just how they identify as a as your as your gender. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gender and sexual orientation are two different things. Sexual orientation is who you want to kiss and hug. Gender is how you feel inside. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one thing that um, we're starting to see more is the use of prefix, like Mr., Miss, Mrs. Like, you know, in our society, we've gotten away from Mrs. We use Ms. a lot. Mm -hmm. Mix, MX, 
is for non-binary folks. So mm -hmm. if you see that come across, um, that's what that is, is refers to. Yeah. Any other questions? Did, did you have a question, Erin? I was just, yeah, it might be helpful to explain. Non-binary. Non yeah, okay. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, in the resources, in the resources that I attached to the to the presentation on the CivicsCon um, digital guide, um, there is a helpful terminology that defines all of the things that we just talked about, all of those LGBTQ plus definitions um, across like two pages. pages. So it'll be really we'll handy. Sure yes, um, yeah. Can I ask one more? Oh, ask as sure. many, as long as we have time. Plus just means there's, there's more. Yeah, it's constantly changing. So yeah. think about it. One time it was LGBT, LGBT, LGB, yeah, LGB, mm -hmm. um, and not all trans folks are gay. Mm -hmm. So we like to put that out there. But it keeps growing as our society grows. As people figure out who they are, um, we're starting to see um, two spirited as well. Um, which uh, so two spirit has been around for two spirit is is unique to the indigenous community and two spirit people have been here forever. <laughs> Forever. A lot of people don't know that. Same in the Me Mexican culture as well as uh, South Pacific as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say real quick, oh. if, any, if anyone's interested in like you know outside the classroom, you take this to the building level. Talk mm -hmm. about gender and sexuality alliances or GSA. If anyone's interested in that work, please talk to me because it's it's why I get up every morning. So, and I think that's the appropriate response to. All of this targeted legislation is just a proliferation of GSAs all over Oklahoma. And then when you can't have a GSA, remembering to refer, refer, refer. There's nothing. There's, I know our laws limit us what we can do in the classroom, but there's no law against referring students to community resources that can that can do more than you can currently do right now in advocating for young people, it for LGBTQ plus young people. GSA yes. Yes, GSA or Gender Sexuality Alliance, rainbow clubs, all sorts of different ways to phrase it. Quilt bag, yeah. Uh, do you have a copy of that uh, resource guide? Like, do you have any extra copies of it, like on paper? Yeah. That I could have one of those to give to you. And yeah. Because it's a, I was looking through them, and it's a great, just educational piece for for people. But um, the second thing, so my sibling. Ash is non-binary. Mm -hmm. Is there a parent? Do you know any like parent resource guide to help learn about non-binary non -binary or something like that? Um, or, just like, P flag. One of the things I cannot recommend enough in the state of Oklahoma is P flag. Um, Nancy McDonald, who is out of the and, and Lori Tilly, who are out of the P flag chapter in Tulsa, they do great work across the state. Um, Nancy McDonald is, she is like 85 and she uh, just zooms around town telling people what's up and how they need to support young people. But she's been supporting parents since the 80s in Oklahoma. Um, There's a really um, attractive chapter in Norman. Are, yes. Where are you at? Are you? No, well, okay. my sibling is 30, but. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. But you know, wherever you contact, the, they'll, they'll know a resource. Yeah. There's actually this really good little book called, um, I say little because it's called The Pocket Change Collective, and um, it's about uh, non-binary identity. Um, it's called A Quick and Easy Guide to, no, Beyond the Gender Binary. I'm just kidding. I lied completely about the title, but here it is. It's by Alok Vladminan, and um, they are a like uh, very uh, popular non-binary uh, author and poet. Mm hmm was there another hand I saw? I thought I saw. I want to honor the time yeah, noting that it is, it is 12.59, so. But if anybody has a question. Thank you for having us.